Well, aloha. aloha. Delighted to be with you today. Welcome to the Grassroot Institute on Maui. We are Maui's number one independent institute for research on the areas of free markets, individual liberty, and limited accountable government. And I want to thank so many of you who are here as members of the Grassroot Institute and supporters, and welcome those of you who are here for the first time. I'm pleased today to be able to introduce our guest, Gail Pooley. But before I do so, let me just introduce myself to you. For those who may not know, I'm Kelii Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. And I'd like to acknowledge a few people who are here. I see one of our board members here, a neighbor island resident, Bill Hastings. You flew in for the big island today. Give Bill, Bill a big hand. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Several of our friends and sponsors are here, and the sponsor for today's event, our dear friend, he, he's over here on one of these tables over here. Let's see, where is he? <laughs> okay, Peter, Peter Martin, you, there you are. You're looking more and more handsome each day. Thank you, I know you've been traveling and thank you for hosting us here today. Well, one of the things that we love to do at the Grassroot Institute is think outside the box. And the best way to think outside the box is to change the paradigm. The paradigm is the pattern, the model that we go by. When I was an economic student back at Northwestern University back in the ancient days of the 1970s, I learned economics through a textbook, the number one textbook in the country on economics called Economics by Paul Samuelson. And it was all based upon a definition of economics that goes back before Adam Smith, which is economics is about scarcity. We take scarce resources and we watch how the rats run the race and how people compete for those scarce resources. Now, when you're looking at everything as a scarce resource, it's kind of like having a hammer and looking at everything like a, a nail. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's a very useful definition and it, it explains a lot of the economic activity that takes place. But it misses some things. For example, let me give you Samuelson's definition. Economics is the study of how scarce resources are allocated to competing ends. How scarce resources are allocated to competing ends. I think I'm pushing the you got my AV control. here. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We'll bring you out a little bit later it's on. Okay. There we go. Ruin the suspense a little right. bit over here. But you know, if, if economics is how scarce resources are allocated to competing ends, you're always seeing everything as scarce. And you're always seeing as the players in economics as always just competing against each other. But what if we turn that on its head and instead started to imagine an economics where there are things that are not scarce, but abundant? It would change the model. Now, I'm not telling you that everything is abundant. But what happens when we look at some things that are abundant and start thinking about how cooperation or how innovation or how new models of competition can release a greater abundance? Now that's exactly what Gail Pooley is gonna talk about today, but I'm gonna give you a, a little example and he's gonna use probably far more profound examples. When you talk to people about the cost of living, and I was just in this room about a week ago with a bunch of people who were talking about housing the cost of living is driven up on Maui and across the islands because of the cost of housing. Housing is thought to be scarce. It's thought to be scarce largely because land is thought to be scarce. And if you have scarce land, you have certain models as to how it gets allocated. The biggest thing in our model of scarce land is that we have a government that parcels out the availability of this land for housing. They've got rules and regulations, they've got a, a bureau that covers housing, that covers land use, that covers everything else. And so you've got this very precious commodity that you're protecting by the government. But what if we looked at the truth of land availability? You know, we've had scholars who've testified here at the Grassroot Institute through their research that land is really not scarce in Hawaii. In fact, we know, having talked with developers and researchers at the University of Hawaii, that in Hawaii, we develop on only 5% of the land mass. Now that may shock you, but you've flown over the islands and think about it, what do you mainly see? You see open land. Now if we develop on only 5% of the land mass, that means 95% of the land mass across the islands is available for something other than just sitting there. Now take a look at most of it. Half of it is for nature preserve, which is a, probably a good idea out here in the middle of the Pacific. Let's preserve nature and protect our aquifer. 
The other half is for agriculture. And did you know that the majority of agriculture land is actually lying fallow? You, you just have to live on Ma Maui to know that. Now, the available land on Maui is well over 90%. But let's go back statewide to our model. Do a little bit of supply and demand math over here. If we build on only 5% of the land and 95% is free, what would happen if we just increase the building from 5% to 6%? Do the math. If we go from 5% of the total and we build on 6%, how much is the increase? Fantastic. This is a smart room. 20%. I bet I can tell your political party or lack thereof from how smart you are. But <laughs> we would increase by 20%. Now let's do this again. Suppose we took the 5% and increased it by two percentage points. How much would we increase the supply? 40%. Now we could keep doing that. How far would, should we go to be feasible? Well, Basically, we're not planning on building on all of the land that is being used for agriculture and all of the land that is being used for nature preserve. But if we just hypothetically went up by two percentage points, if you released 40% more land, what would happen to the supply and demand with that scarce resource? That's right, and the price point would go down as long as we didn't sell it all to the rich developers here but uh, maybe the rich developers would sell it all back to us, as, as long as we found a way to keep China from buying it all. My point is this. Our whole frame of reference changes when we stop thinking about scarcity, but we think about the potential abundance. Do you follow what I'm saying? And we can have a lot of more of the good things in life when we shift our frame of reference. Today to talk about that is a dear friend, Gail Pooley, whom I respect greatly. He's not only a researcher and an economist with impeccable credentials and writings, he's also a teacher of young men and women at Brigham Young University back on Oahu. And it's my privilege today to introduce Gail and invite him to come here and talk to us about the possibilities that happen when we think out of the box and think instead of scarcity, think about abundance. Please welcome, and we have a lay for him which is sitting right over here which he can take home to his beautiful wife. Please welcome Gail Pooley. Gail, come on up. All right, Dr. Akina, thank you very much. Take it away. Take it away, Gail. All right. So uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, thank you, Grassroots Institute, and thank you, Dr. Akina, for uh, providing the leadership that we could all come together and, and discuss these ideas. Um, you may have seen this movie recently, uh, Avengers, Infinity Wars. If you remember what Thanos said in this movie, um, it's simple calculus. The Earth is finite, its resource is finite. If uh, life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correcting. Any idea where he may have gotten his idea? Well, I think he got his idea from this guy. Um, he was a scientist. He's a scientist at uh, Stanford, and he said, "Society needs rescaling. We've got to reduce the size of the entire human enterprise." Paul Ehrlich was his name, and if you've uh, been around very long, you may have uh, had to uh, read this book. I had to read this book when I was in junior high. It was a sign, the population bomb. It came out in 1968, where Ehrlich makes this case that we're going to have this catastrophic event occur if we don't stop uh, population growth. Well, uh, some leaders in China got a hold of this book and they implemented a policy and that policy basically is what we have today uh, in China where there are 34 million more men than women. Um, you may have noticed that other people have picked up on this idea. Uh, is it still okay to have children? Where did this idea come from? Well, one of the originators of the idea was a uh, Englishman, uh, uh, Thomas Malthus, and he writes, the power of population is infinitely greater than the, power, uh, than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. Well, uh, Ehrlich picks up on this deal, and he continues this ideology of scarcity. Uh, so he has this idea, he writes this book, another guy picks up this book, begins to read it, and agrees with it, uh, initially agrees with the logic. And uh, then he said, you know, maybe I should actually look at the facts of what, what, is, what, what has happened historically. And that guy's name was Julian Simon. And as he began to look at the facts, the economic prices of things, he said, not only uh, aren't you not right, Paul, but you're actually 
Wrong, prices have been going down as population has increased. The facts suggest the opposite. So both of these men believe that there was a relationship between prices and population. Uh, as population increases, uh, Ehrlich argued uh, that prices would go up. You know, we add more people to the planet, we got a pizza here, we add more people, the, uh, people, the slices will get smaller, the price will go up, we'll eventually crash. Simon, on the other hand, argued the opposite. He said that as population increased, prices would actually go down. That prices would go down. So who was right? Well, they had this uh, very robust argument for a number of years, and finally Simon said, you know, Paul, why don't we just bet? Let's bet. And Ehrlich said, yeah, I'd love to bet you. So he, along with two of his colleagues, uh, uh, Simon said, well, just pick five metals that are non-renewable, and let's put a contract for 10 years, and we'll adjust it for inflation, and we'll see what happens. So the basis of the bet was $1,000. And uh, it was for copper, chromium, uh, nickel, tungsten, and tin. So you have five metals, and the contract was for $200 for each metal. The end of uh, this contract was from uh, September of 1980 for 10 years. It's 10 years, let's see what the bet says. So, what do you think happened? Well, behold, one of the most important checks ever written in economics. This was a check written from Paul Ehrlich uh, to Julian Simon in uh, October of 1990. The inflation, uh, 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 the uh, price had fallen by 57%. Adjusted for, for real prices, it had fallen by 36% of these five metals. Some of the metals had actually, I think, 10 had fallen by somewhere on, on the order of 80%. So, here was our question. If Julian Simon were around today, would he still win this bet? So our research looked at that. Uh, the original Simon Ehrlich bet covered five metals and it was for a 10 year period. And we thought, well, why don't we expand this so they only had 50 data points, five metals for 10 years. We expanded our analysis and we said, why don't we expand this and we're going to look at uh, 50 items. We could go beyond these five metals and we really, tried to identify the 50 foundational commodities that are necessary for civilization. So we've got oil, we've got these metals, but we've got uh, wheat, rice, cotton. Uh, we've got these uh, commodities that are global commodities that are foundational commodities. So our data looked at 50 items over 38 years. Go back to 1980 and bring it up today. So our results were published in um, uh, Cato published our results, and we actually call it the Simon Abundance Index. And this was the result of our research. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what this project involved. First of all, we came up with a new definition of abundance. Okay? What is abundance? Well, we define it, and it's a definition that we can quantify. We can measure abundance. The second thing we did is we expanded it to 50 commodities, not just five. We also converted things to time prices. And I want to talk about this a little more, but fundamentally time prices um, are taking a price and dividing it by hourly income and coming up with how much time do you have to work to earn the money to buy that thing? And what happens to that over time? That's really the measurement, the time price. Money price is interesting, time price is much more interesting. Money prices are in dollars and cents, time prices are in hours and minutes. So we developed this simple idea of using time prices. And then we also uh, developed something called the price elasticity of population. Back to this idea that Simon and Ehrlich both argued that there was a relationship between population and prices. So what is that relationship? What is that relationship? So we used the uh, price elasticity of population to attempt to measure that. And then we ended up uh, developing this index that takes all 50 commodities, puts them into an index, and says, what happened to this? Uh, value of this index over these 38 years. So first of all, we say abundance is the relationship between t population and time prices. The way you measure abundance is, are time prices going up or down with respect to population? Population increases, do time prices go up or down? So that's our, our uh, uh, mathematical definition that we're able to quantify. <clears throat> so. We expanded our database to include 50 items. You note there, we have crude oil, natural gas, uh, coal, we have coffee, tea, 
uh, food, bananas, these are all uh, commodities that the World Bank tracks. So we could go to the World Bank and get the nominal prices of all these commodities back to 1960. We, we, we went to 1980 because that was where this bet began with Simon and Ehrlich. So World Bank has the data, IMF has the data on these prices, so we go to an independent source to get the data on the prices, the nominal prices. And the BLS also tracks bananas. I think we, we included bananas and BLS does that for us. So we also acknowledge that when we have innovation, right? And innovation is, is you have human beings that have ideas. The proof of that idea is an invention. And an invention that is a market successful invention is an innovation. Now, an innovation shows up in a variety of ways, but it shows up, first of all, on lower prices. But it also shows up in higher incomes. So if you have an innovation, it could actually increase people's incomes as well as lower prices. So when we think about a time price, we're measuring both of those. What's happening to the, time, to the price and what's happening to people's income. Okay? So we really think that measuring it that way, we get to see the whole picture. You really get to see the whole picture. You're not just seeing one side or the other. Put them both together and look at that ratio. Adam Smith uh, recognized this uh, in The Wealth of Nation. He, he said, the real price of everything is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. What is bought with money is purchased by labor. Is that true for you? When I think about it, I have to buy something, it's like, well, how much time is this going to cost me to go earn the money to buy this? And we all note that, that that should be getting cheaper for all of us over time. So. Money price, dollars and cents. Time price, hours and minutes. Money prices, we typically think of money prices as we have nominal prices and we have real prices. To get a real price, we divide a nominal price by some kind of a deflator, right? CPI, PPI, uh, there's, there's lots of deflators out there. The beauty of time prices is you can ignore all of these adjustments. You don't have to, to try to convert things to real prices. So you don't have to deal with the arbitrary, subjective contention that these deflators can create. You know, is inflation 2% this year or is it 5%? What is it? We well, don't worry about that. Just look at the time price, and that will tell you what's really fundamentally happening. So time prices, we just simply take the money price, the nominal price. What's the sandwich today? It's $10. What's my hourly income? I'm making $20 an hour. The sandwich is 30 minutes. Well, what happened, what's happening to that price over time? So if the money price goes down and the hourly income goes up, time prices are going to go down, right? And even if the money price goes up, if the hourly income goes up faster, the time price will go down. Grandpa used to always say, look, Hershey bars, when I was a kid, they were only five cents. And now they're like, you know, back then it was like they're 50 cents. I'd say, yeah, Grandpa, but you were, you were making like five cents an hour. And now you're making $20 an hour. They're a lot cheaper. You can't just look at the price. It has to be compared to your income. Okay? All right, so we don't have to worry about these deflators. You know, those all, those all go away. We, can, we, we don't use those. Okay? So what should we use for the denominator in the equation, this hourly price? Uh, should we use your income, my income? Whose income should we use? Well, we looked at the whole world and said these are world prices. Why don't we try to estimate what world uh, global GDP or global income is? And the data that was available to us is World Bank keeps track of uh, uh, GDP per capita. And then we had to come up with an estimate of how much people worked. And the conference board also tracks uh, the, the, the conference board tracks that data. So we were able to calculate GDP per capita per hour. How much does an average person create an income per hour on the planet. So that was our index that we were able to use. Um, let's just use this methodology now and apply it to oranges. Go back to 1980 and look at the price of oranges and what they were today. So 1980, the nominal price, once again, we, we deal with nominal numbers. We don't have to make any inflation. You could buy uh, a kilo of oranges were about 40 cents. Uh, Today, it's about 80 cents, so it's the, price, the nominal price almost doubled. But what do we really want to think about? What happened to income over that period? Did income double? Did it more than double? Did it less than double? Well, GDP per capita in 20, uh, 1980 was about 2,500 per person a year. 
Today, it's uh, about 11,000. So income has increased by 357%. But another factor that we have to consider is what's the hourly rate? In uh, 1980, people worked on the average about 2,100 hours. Today, they work uh, about 1,965. So the number of hours that people work has actually fallen by, by over 9%. So that hourly rate is we just take the how much was your annual GDP? How many hours did you work? That's what you're generating per hour. So we get $1.16 in 1980 and we get 5.83 in 2018. 2018. So now we're ready to actually do the time calculation. We take the 40 cents, divide it by $1.16, and we get uh, 0.346 hours or about 21 minutes. In 2018, it's about eight minutes. Okay? So the time price of oranges has fallen by over 60%. So what does that mean? Well, we can actually think about that a little deeper. Here's a chart, by the way, of oranges, the time price of oranges. The blue line is oranges. The, uh, the orange line is the whole commodity index, all 50 of them. And then we just draw a linear line there to kind of show what's happening. Now, Julian Simon said, you know, we don't expect prices just to continually go down. What we expect is there are going to be periods where you're going to have a spike in the price. And it's going to go up. But it's generally going to be temporary. Four things will happen when the price goes up. When the price goes up, what's the first thing you do? You and I do. We, we could, our quantity demand goes down. We're not going to buy as much. The second thing is people will try to go find some more of it. Right? The third thing is people will look for substitutes. And the fourth thing is people will recycle. All four of these things combined will ultimately cause that price to turn and come back down. So you see this series of up and downs, but the overall trend, look what that overall trend is doing. Okay? All right, so we have this percentage change. We can actually develop what we call a time price multiplier, and we can calculate the percentage change in the time price multiplier, and we can also calculate the compounded annual growth rate of uh, your abundance and the years to double. So the time price multiplier just says, look, if I spend an hour in 1980 working, how many oranges can I get? Now, if I spend an hour in 2018 working, how many oranges could I get? So we just take the time price in 1980 divided by the time price today, and that will tell us what that multiplier is. Okay? Now, the reason we do that is because how low can prices go? They can only go down to minus 100%, the percentage change, they can only fall by 100%, then they're free. Well, what that relationship is geometric. In other words, as you go lower and lower in that price uh, reduction, your multiplier increases geometrically. So here's the deal with oranges. If you have a time price that's fallen by 60.8%, one orange in 1980, the time will get you 3.55 oranges. So how, how much more abundant have oranges become? It looks like two and a half times more abundant than they were in 1980. And if you calculate that rate over that 38-year period, uh, the percentage change, abundance has increased by 155%. Oranges are 155% more abundant today than they were in 1980. Uh, that, that suggests a compounded annual growth rate of two and a half percent. Abundance is increasing at two and a half percent. If you think about it in terms of how long it takes for something to double, it takes about 28 years for oranges to double in abundance based on what we've looked at in those, those years. So that's just oranges. When we step back and look at all 50 commodities, uh, and we covered things from aluminum to zinc and 48 other items in between, what do you think happened to that index overall? All 50 of those commodities. Similar to what happened to oranges. Yeah. Oranges actually didn't fall quite as much as the rest of the commodities. Uh, I think it was zinc fell the least. I think it was um, which uranium actually fell the most. All 50 of them fell. There wasn't one of them that had, is more expensive today than it was in 1980. Not one of them. Okay. So the overall average is about 72% decline. So, if it falls by 72%, that means the time price multiplier is 3.62. I buy one basket of these things in 1980, I get 3.62 of them in 2018 for the same amount of time. Okay? Suggesting uh, 
you're compounding about 3.44%. It means every 20 years, you get twice as much stuff. Same amount of time, you get twice as much stuff. So let's go back and think about population as it relates to this. That was one of our original uh, things that we wanted to test. What's the relationship between population and these time prices? What happened to population from 1980 to 2018? Global population. How much did it increase by? Double. Yeah, almost doubled. Yeah, about 4.5 billion up to 7.6 billion. So population increased by about 71%. Interesting. So uh, our price elasticity of population equation basically says, well, what's the percentage change in one divided by the percentage change in the other one? And what we were able to conclude is time prices fell by 72%, population increases by 71%. It looks like this elasticity says, Every time you add 1% more to the population, prices for everybody goes down by 1%. How could that be possible? How could that be possible? All right. So we also discovered four different abundant zones that we uh, talked about in the paper. Okay. Got a little quiz for you. In 1980, you invite 100 of your friends over for dinner. And at that time, it costs you $10 per person to buy the food to feed them. What's your bill going to be? A thousand bucks. Okay. Now, 2018, you invite 71% more people to dinner, but prices have fallen by 72%. Now, what is your bill? What's your bill now? Is this adjusted for inflation then? Or no? no, you don't have to. No, we're just doing time prices. I'm going to have to call Mrs. Schwartz, your fourth grade teacher, and let her know you've got to come back and have a chat with her. Because isn't the math, now it's 1.71, or now you've invited 171 people? And what are the, what's the... Uh, yeah, I think... Yeah, you rounded to 479. So what's happened to your bill? Your bill has fallen by more than half. You've increased the people that come to your event by 71%, but when we pay the bill, it's less than half. I find that astonishing. But that's really, in fact, what's happened, hasn't it? I mean, the facts of these prices and what people have done with their productivity is that superabundance, remember there's four different zones, superabundance is this zone where no matter how many more people come to dinner, your bill decreases. Your total bill decreases. Yeah, so we take all that, uh, we take the prices and we also take the population and that's what we roll into the, to the index, the overall index, which really says, look, if you add more people and prices go down, how do you measure that? Well, what percentage increase did you have in population and what percentage decrease did you have in the prices? And that index, we started in 1980 with an index value of one. We benchmark it to 1980 and the index value, we set it to 100. So we're taking the change in the time price multiplier times the one plus the change in the population. And that gets us uh, times 100. And that gets us 3.62. Remember, things got 3.62 more abundant, our commodities. And we have 71% more people. Multiply those together times 100. It says the index today is at about 618, 619. So things are 519% more abundant than they were 38 years ago. All right? So there's what the index looks like. The blue line's the index. Once again, some years, things got bad, uh, got worse. Other years, you know, things got better. But look at the overall trend. The orange line, the overall trend says, it looks like, from 1980 at least, things look pretty good. Okay? So, index starts at 100, goes to 618. That's a 519% increase in abundance. Growth rate, of, that's a growth rate of 5% a year, which means you're going to double every 14 years. Every 14 years, our, our planet doubles in abundance based on the way we've defined abundance. Does that, does that make sense? So our project, once again, we came up with a new definition of abundance. We look at 50 commodities. We convert these prices to time prices. We develop a price elasticity uh, equation with a coefficient that we interpret. And then we develop that index. Our site, uh, I'll give you a link to the site. We have all those indexes there. 
You can go in there and look at each one of them. The first column there is the nominal price, GDP per capita per hour. Shows you the time price, so you can go in there and look at each one of these commodities. We also have a couple of calculators that allow you to go in and plug in your own time price and your own commodity price. Look, when I was in 1980, I get my first job, I'm making four bucks an hour, and I look at the price of gas, I can look at those two prices and figure out the time price in 1980 and look at it today. It's gotten a lot cheaper, and this calculator will do those calculations for you. So, back to our original three characters, Malthus, Ehrlich, and Thanos. We believe that they were analyzing things at the wrong level of analysis. They were counting things, physical things. That's not the appropriate level of analysis. In fact, if you go and look at England, uh, if Malthus had done a little more research, he would have discovered that things were getting more abundant, not less abundant. England from 1700 to 1790, he writes his book in 1798, population in England had increased almost 50%. But the uh, GDP per capita had actually increased by 93%. So the key question is, well, what's happening to the price of stuff? Well, the price of flour actually had increased, it increased, but it only increased 35%. So if my income goes up by 90%, but prices go up by 30%, who's happy? Well, the time price is going down by 30%, which when we convert it to a multiplier, it said the multiplier, for the time it took me to work to buy one pound of flour in 1700, I could buy 1.3 uh, pounds in uh, 1798, things had become 43% more abundant in that period in England, right? So it's like, you should have checked your facts. You should have, you should have checked your facts, okay? There's a source on that. So here's the issue. These guys are doing their analysis. They are counting stuff, right? They're doing quantity. They're doing addition. Now, we know that quantity is an interesting number, but Prices have more information content, right? When you go to the store and buy a loaf of bread, do you count the number of loaves on the shelf or do you look at the price? What's more interesting to you? Price. The price has more information density than quantity. You should go to at least price. So then the question is what price should you use? Well, we think you should use time prices. We think that they really reflect the resource and how, uh, what kind of relationship it has to people's time. And then if you look at the change in time prices over time, that's really will tell you what's happening. So these guys are at this level. Where should they be? They should have been, they should have been down here. Once again, is the quantity important to you or the change in time price over time? I'm really interested in what's happening. It's got to be that change in time price over time. So George Gilder, he uh, was part of this uh, study that we did, and he said, some, he said Julian Simon was the most important economist of the 20th century. He may be the central figure of, the 20, of 21st century economics. So <clears throat> I truly believe that Julian Simon was awarded the Nobel Prize this last year. And uh, he actually, how did he do that? He died in 1998. Well, Paul Romer actually accepted the prize on his behalf. Because what has Romer what was he awarded the prize for? He was awarded the prize for talking about this very concept. How do we measure abundance? He says an economy grows whenever people take resources and rearrange them in a way that makes them more valuable. So the analogy that we use, the metaphor that we use here is, how many keys are there on a piano? 88 keys. So how many songs are in a piano? Yeah, so should we be counting the keys? You know, if you're a biologist, which is great, you count things, that's good. Uh, if you're a politician, you might count things. If you're an engineer, you count things. But if you're an economist, what do you do? Economists, and Julian Simon would tell us, tell us this, he'd say, you need to listen to the prices. You need to listen to the creativity that entrepreneurs are developing with this music. Yeah, we have a limited number of keys, we have a fixed number of atoms on this planet, but the way we rearrange those things the way that we're able to create things almost out of nothing, that's the thing that's important to us. So there's our study, and uh, there's where you can go look at it. Um, I just want to thank Julian Simon for being the guy that gave us this. I do have uh, just a one-page summary of all of these prices for you to, to look at. And uh, this is preliminary for 2018, so... Um,
Yeah, if you want to just pass those around. But take a look at these. You've got aluminum, bananas, zinc, all kinds of stuff there. Uh, let me save one of those. So the way to read this is you have the commodity, you have the units that it's priced in, you have the 1980 nominal price and the 2018 nominal price and the percentage change in the nominal price. And then we plug in the two rates, $1.16 an hour in 2018 and 583 in, or $1.16 in 1980 and $1.583 in 2018. And that will let you calculate the time price. And then you just look at the percentage change in the time price. And that will then let you work, the, work with the, uh, the multiplier and the annual growth rate years to double. So overall, our index grew about 3.6 uh, times. And you'll note here that some of them grew much faster. Once again, what was the big one? I think it was uranium. ST, yeah, uranium, 7.9 more plentiful zinc only grew by 30%, uh, 31%, but all of them grew. So, um, yeah, I think if Julian Simon were here today, he'd say, you know, uh, listen to the music. Uh, Thanos makes this argument. Here's what, uh, here's what I think we have to understand is, look, policy is being made based on uh, things that uh, policymakers think are facts. And what we believe is that, that those guys are mismeasuring the facts, that they need to take a different perspective and think about this from a different way to really truly understand what's happening. And um, so I'd invite you all to uh, join the new Guardians of the Galaxy and become familiar with this uh, work and, and try to explain it and share it with other people so they can understand that we truly live in a time of, of just phenomenal abundance. Each one of us has this kind of infinity stone that we can create value here on this planet for one another. And if we use that, its value is all around us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gail Cooley. Let's have a big hand for Gail. Great job. Now I'd like to let you interact with Gail if you would want to and ask some questions. Gail, could you step back just a little bit over here to your left? And whoever would like to ask Gail a question, come up here and join me so we can put you on the microphone and we can have you broadcast out to everybody else who's watching. And by the way, the uh, you can keep the mic, Gail. That's going to work fine. And uh, did you enjoy listening to that? That was very interesting. And, and I think that one of the things that we see demonstrated by Gail is a shift in paradigm. Instead of thinking in terms of only scarcity, Let's start thinking in terms of abundance and creating abundance. Joe, you have a first question. Come on up here. And I think you all know who Joe is, our Executive Vice President at Grassroot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I just had a question about how did Simon know that um, you know, the time prices would go down? Was it just a guess? Um, or, or did, he, uh, did he have some kind of principle that was driving his guess? You know, he said, they asked him, because originally yeah. he agreed with Ehrlich. He said, oh, yeah, your theory looks like it's, uh, you know, makes sense. It makes sense until you think about it. It really made sense until you check the facts. And Simon had access to uh, historical prices. So he goes back and starts looking at prices of things. He said, you know, the trend isn't, prices have not been going up. And these are just nominal prices. He was adjusting just for inflation. He said, prices have not gone up, they've actually gone down. And uh, so he, he ultimately concluded, he goes, well, what changed your mind? He said, the facts. The facts are what changed my mind. I, I began to, th you know, I started with this idea that, yeah, Ehrlich has to be true. This theory is true. I mean, it is reasonable. If you make the assumption that we don't innovate, you know, and the problem is, is Ehrlich came from this problem uh, from the perspective of a, he was an in, he's an insect scientist. You put two cockroaches in a box and you put a sugar cube in there, you know, they'll eat the sugar, they'll make some baby cockroaches, and then they'll collapse, right? Humans are not cockroaches. You know, so I think he fundamentally made that error of looking at quantity instead of looking at prices, and then thinking about human beings, we are innovating machines. You know, if you're given a little small measure of freedom, like China, small measure of freedom, and, and suddenly you have this huge amount of wealth that's discovered that was there. I mean, it's there all the time. Very good. Now, could anyone else, if you'd like to ask a question, come on up and join us here, please. Aloha. 
Could you just introduce yourself and Hello, ask your I'm question? Sylvia Cabral. Sylvia. Hi. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, um, if there's so much abundance, why is the, uh, you know, people like Jeff Bezos and Musk, why are they saying that we have to go to space because there's not enough on Earth? And then my second question, I'll just say really quick. What happens to a product when a whole nation like the Bahamas gets wiped out? Okay, first question. Great question, Sylvia. First question, I would recommend that you look at a video that was just posted that had Elon and, Musk and Jack Ma. And Gail, could you put your microphone oh, through your mouth? Thank you. Uh, I would suggest that you take a look at a video on uh, YouTube. Uh, Elon Musk, the Mars guy, we got to go to Mars, and uh, Jack Ma, the founder of uh, Alibaba, the Amazon of China. And it's, it, the, the, it was a beautiful discussion because it made so clear the difference between this obsession with going to another place that is a very, it's a very unwelcoming place. You, you really want to go to Mars when you have this planet here that's, that's so full of resources? And Ma's the guy that says, you know, I'm interested in life on Earth and creating value here. Yeah, if you want to go to Mars, the, you know, Elon and, and those guys, it's, where's their vision going? It's, I don't know, but the facts suggest here's the place you're going to increase human prosperity and wealth on this planet. And then your second question about Bahamas. Look, we've got natural disasters that occur all the time on the planet. We're not going to escape that. What we're going to be able to do and what we've demonstrated our ability to do is adapt and prepare for those events. You go back to the early 1900s and you look at the uh, deaths that were caused by these natural disasters and compared to today, it is, it's like this. I mean, we anticipate, we compare it. How many people died in the Bahama thing? We don't know yet, but was it 10,000? Was it 100,000? Yeah, somebody said the other day, it's like 37, 28. Uh, you know, we have a volcano over here. Did anybody die? My you know? question was, excuse me, my question was about the product when the whole nation gets wiped out, then how do those prices, the product of the prices they produce? What do you think? Somebody could answer that question. Well, if everything's destroyed, the prices should go up initially. Okay. And so there's an equilibrium. There's gonna, if the prices go up, if, let's say oil's more, is, there's no more oil or something over on the island, they're going to bring it over there until prices go down to a, there's an equilibrium. I'm right. just going to repeat that because we want everyone to get this on the broadcast. The gentleman suggested that prices will go up. Go ahead, Gail. Yeah, that's absolutely true, and that's what you want to have happen. You want people to understand things have become very scarce here. The price is very high. So what should you do? You use less, you go look for more, you look for a substitute, or you try to recycle. And it's a tragedy, but this is a temporary tragedy. Bahamas in five years, if you don't have intervention into those markets, will recover. Will recover. And humanity, you know, we have this great feeling toward our fellow human beings to try to assist and help. The great photo I saw was before, you know, this thing was going to hit the U.S., you had all of these trucks lined up, Walmart trucks, filled ready to go back into those markets and replace all those goods as soon as they could. The market will respond to that. Very good. Any other questions for Gail? As you're walking up, let me throw one out to you, Gail. Gail, you and I kind of were growing up on the same reading material. I remember reading Paul Ehrlich as a high school student back in 1975, The Population Bomb, and then all the writings of the Club of Rome, which were really all about the fact that we probably shouldn't still be here on the planet <laughs> anyway, and Thomas Malthus, the prophet of doom, of course. But since that time, I've become familiar with the work of the economic freedom of the world, which I know you know, and the economic freedom of North America. And one of the things that they've shown is that in nations in which there's a high level of innovation and productivity, you actually have an increase in the quality of life, both for the rich and for the poor. How does that work uh, compare to your work? How does it dovetail? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, look at China. I mean, go back to 1976, and if someone were to say, look, China's going to be this, this, this in 2018, you know, one in a million people would, uh, I mean, a million people would have said, you're nuts. Very few people said, you know, if they were given just a small measure of freedom, 
with some property rights, with a currency that's pretty solid, with some consistency with the rules and regulation, those people will escape poverty. And sure enough, from 1980 to uh, today, 88% of China used to live on less than $2 a day. Now it's less than 2%. So human beings plus freedom, maybe freedom is the exponent. There's a relationship between human beings, the ideas that they produce, and then being able to take those ideas and prove the idea with an invention and then have a market that they can take the invention to with an entrepreneur where they can determine whether they've created value or not. If you have those simple things in place, human beings are, uh, I mean, tremendously creative and productive. And that productivity helps all the rest of us. I mean, all the rest of us are the beneficiaries of just a few of these people that, are, that, that have these gifts and talents. We don't want to... We want to find them and encourage them, right? I tell my students, look, Steve Jobs, uh, founder, co-founder of Apple, his father was from Syria, right? Well, what if Steve Jobs had been born in Syria instead of California? Would our world be different today? I think it'd be different. Now, let me ask you, how many Steve Jobs are sitting in Syria today? They're sitting there, they're inactive, entrepreneurs because the culture and the conditions aren't allowing them to do something. These people are all over the planet. Gail, uh, one of the uh, complaints of people here on the island of Maui when the population goes up is that it's the worst thing that could happen, that increasing our population of Maui or increasing the population of Hawaii is a terrible thing. What you've shown is that under the right conditions, the growing population could actually enhance the quality of life and improve living. How much more can we have population growth in Hawaii? What would you say? And would that be an optimal thing to increase our population? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> that's a hard question. I mean, look, if you know that people really are the ultimate resource, and we think about scarcity, the scarcity on the planet, isn't that we're running, you know, we're not running out of oil or iron ore or wheat, we're running out of people. People are becoming more and more scarce. If that wasn't the case, why do you have to pay more and more for, for people? Now, the issue in a place like this is how do you kind of deal with the externalities of additional people? Who pays when we add another person to the island? You know, who pays that price? Well, you know, if we said, let's put this in reverse and say, well, what if we got rid of 90% of the people on the island? Would it be a better place? Okay, who decides what 90% have to go? And then what do you have? My mother used to tell me, man, it's so, the roads have gotten so busy. On my way to Walmart, it's just like there's so many cars. It's like, Mom, if there weren't people here, you wouldn't have a Walmart to go to. You know, we're, we've got this trade-off we've got to make, but ultimately our lives have got to be so much better than our parents or even us 38 years ago. And... Why would it not continue to do that? Why would it not continue to get better? As more and more people on the planet are able to enjoy freedom, the opportunity to connect and communicate with each other, the access to markets where they can go test their ideas, why would it not get better? Well, we have natural disasters and political issues and military problems, but the underlying humanity's performance is, is pretty astonishing. Well, I want to give a big hand of applause to Gail. Thank him so much for being with us today. Just